suis venue en France pour I took a year off and I came to France. I wanted to take a break from my work. And I came to do a biblical and theological training at the Abbey of Haute-Combe. It was at that moment that the Lord spoke to me, that he was really present. I'd tell myself, either they're making fun of me, or they're just being nice, or they don't want to tell me that what I made isn't good. For me, it was impossible to really hear someone tell me that I'm good. I'd answer with a big smile without saying anything, but in fact, in my heart, I couldn't accept it. I didn't understand. I couldn't understand that really I could be a good person. This is a habit that I'd acquired in my youth, because in my family, I'd experienced denigration. Also, in society in general, people often expect others to be perfect, so when we're not up to par, we are considered useless. So there were many things that made me have this habit of considering what I do as useless, and who I am as useless, and myself as unworthy. In the community, they suggested that I follow this Siloam program, which runs in three retreats over the course of a year, to review our life, work on what we don't like, and follow the Lord better. And it was during one of the retreats that I was able to discover my relationship with the Lord. What happened is that I believed. I believed that Christ really healed me. He really freed me. He's always there, and He loves me just the way I am. Christ sees me in this way, and this helps me to be kind and capable. In our everyday life, we sometimes feel a lack of freedom. It's as if we get stuck over and over again because of a certain attitude or an inner thought. At times, this frustration shows up in everyday situations as an exaggerated negative reaction. This could be a disproportionate anger, a closed-off attitude, or a difficulty in trusting others. And despite all our efforts, these attitudes keep coming back. In the end, we even give up fighting against these sins, these sins which are akin to slavery. Any of these difficult situations may be a sign that we need deliverance. Paul says in the letter to the Galatians, for freedom Christ set us free. The very word deliverance may seem strange to some, Indeed, there are some churches where there is little talk of deliverance. Either people think that it doesn't pertain to them, or they think it's only about exorcism. In some countries or places, where people are more aware of the surrounding spiritual reality, deliverance is, on the contrary, very present. This word can also be scary, admittedly, as we immediately think of something spectacular, reinforced by imaginary scenes from the movies. However, deliverance and liberation are deeply rooted in the ministry of Jesus. Jesus, who came to free every man and every woman. In inaugurating his public ministry in the synagogue of Capernaum, Jesus proclaimed that he came to fulfill the words of Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring glad tidings to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim liberty to captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free. So we need to be delivered from evil. This is what we ask from the Lord, daily, when we say the Lord's Prayer. Evil in the Our Father does not mean an abstract force or a negative energy, but rather evil in person, whom sacred scripture knows by the name of the tempter, the father of lies, Satan, or the devil. In summary, Christian life involves a spiritual struggle, and the deliverance of evil spirits is part of the mission that Jesus entrusted to his church.
Following the Conference on the Deliverance Ministry in Rome in 2014 organized by the ICRES, International Service of Catholic Charismatic Renewal, which brought together theologians and practitioners from around the world, the document The Ministry of Deliverance was published. The ICRES, an organization recognized by the Holy See since 1993, is responsible for providing the link between worldwide Catholic charismatic renewal and the Church authorities. Dr. Mary Healy, Chairwoman of the ICRES Doctrinal Commission and Professor of Sacred Scripture at the Sacred Heart Major Seminary in Detroit, Michigan, and Father Etienne Vetu, member of the Chemin Neuf community and professor of theology at the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome, are the main writers of this document. The drafting of this document was also a significant event for the Church. Firstly, because we worked with theologians in the United States, in India and in Germany, as well as practitioners of all kinds from quite a few different countries. So this work provided an opportunity to work together in a unified manner. We realized to what extent in the depth of our hearts we thought and felt the same things. Despite the different ways we did things, our hearts were united. We were amazed by the positive reception we received from the church authorities. So, naturally, there were also a number of people who reacted saying, stop talking about evil spirits. That's just superstition. That's a pretty primitive way of thinking. And it seems to me that the most important thing is to proclaim the Lordship of Christ, the power of the freedom that He wants to give us, and the effectiveness of His power to deliver us, and that we do not always have to understand exactly every aspect of what we have been delivered from. Sin remains a mystery, the forces of evil too. And in our times, it's also important to find a simple but consistent message regarding these powers of evil. What we see in the New Testament is that not only are demons active in a few very troubled, demon-possessed individuals, but in some sense in all of human society, in all of human life. So Jesus calls Satan the ruler of this world. St. Paul calls him the God of this world. And the first letter of John says that the whole world is in the power of the evil one. So every one of us is in some way affected by the malignant influence of evil spirits. Scripture tells us a lot about how Satan works. He works through temptation to sin. He works through deception, making good appear evil, making evil appear good making God out to be an enemy, making us think we can't trust God. Satan works through fear. He fills us with all kinds of fear of, of physical calamities, but also uh, subtle fears, fear of opposition or failure or human disapproval. And whenever we allow ourselves to be ruled by those fears, we can end up placing ourselves under the influence of evil spirits. Their influence in human lives is due to sin. Jesus says, whoever sins makes himself a slave to sin. So every time we choose to disobey God, we place ourselves in some way under the influence of evil spirits. But the good news is that Jesus, by his death and resurrection, has defeated Satan, and we can share in his victory. The Gospels give us many beautiful accounts of Jesus' activity of casting out demons, and each one shows us something unique. For instance, in the casting out of a demon from a man in the synagogue, we see from the people's response that they're astonished. They say a new teaching. He, he casts out the demons with a word. And that shows us that it's Jesus' teaching of the truth, his proclamation of the word of God, that in itself has a power to free people from captivity to evil. Because spiritual oppression is very often rooted in lies and deception.
There is a great mystery. How is it possible for a spirit outside us, which is not us, to influence our will and affect our freedom? Most theologians throughout the centuries argued, in my opinion, quite rightly, that this is not possible. That is to say, the devil and the demons can affect our imagination and touch our emotions so they can instill fear. They can suggest images that will scare or make us fall into despair or that will attract us. But they cannot directly touch our intelligence and our will. That is, they cannot control us like a puppeteer controlling a puppet. On the other hand, what happens is that these concerns, this fear, this despair, these different elements can lead us to react in a certain way and to certain forms of behavior. For example, I shut myself away whenever someone hurts me, or I sense something bad, or I've been hurt. For example, the automatic reaction of a woman who's been hurt by a man or by several men will be to feel a sense of hatred towards these men. At which point the evil spirit will accompany this movement, accentuate it, and gradually lead the woman to consent to it. What happens is that the will, by the consent that has been given to a certain form of behavior, to the lie, and the spirit or spirits that lurk in the background becomes bound. There's not really a better description than the word bound. We can also use the word paralyzed, that is, we feel like changing it, but nothing happens. We can ask ourselves who can perform the prayer of deliverance, or more generally, the deliverance itself. I would like to distinguish between performing deliverance and a ministry of deliverance, because they are not exactly the same. Anyone can perform a certain form of deliverance. This is a power entrusted by Christ to us, that is, every baptized person, every Christian, every believer. The most obvious sign of this is that the Lord Jesus sent the apostles to cast out evil spirits. But in Luke, for example, chapter 10, when he sends out the 70, that is to say those who are the image, the model of all the disciples, they return from the mission saying, we have cast out demons in your name. And Jesus answers, I saw the devil fall from heaven. This is the sign that the disciples, all the disciples, had received authority in the name of Jesus to cast out demons, and that Jesus confirmed them, and he was in agreement with this practice. And at the end of the Gospels, when he sends them on their mission to go out and baptize the nations, baptize the nations, preach and cast out demons. This is a mission that applies to everyone. There are many ways of practicing deliverance, many ways of praying for deliverance. And there is not one model. But it seems to me that there are at least two aspects that should always be present. One aspect is the renunciation, and the other aspect is the direct order given to the Spirit, or at least a word of command. The renunciation means that the person who is bound must, either spontaneously or when asked by those who are praying with him, say, I renounce. For example, the spirit of shutting myself away. I renounce the spirit of hatred. Or I renounce my behavior of hate, etc. Why is this important? Because ultimately, what opens the door to the Spirit is my consent. I was the one who consented. So I appeal to the same freedom which the Lord gives me, which is touched by grace, by my baptism, by the theological virtues, and by the Christian life and faith, 
euh, et parle avec cette volonté, and it is with an act of this same will arrière, that I will go back and renounce what I consented to. I, I was the one who let it in, entrer, and I am the one who is responsible for making it leave. <laughs> Alors, On the other hand, comme given that we believe these cases of bondage to be not simply a vulnerability, but the actual presence of a force of evil, a spirit, it is not enough to renounce it. The spirit must also be ordered to leave. Once again, there are several ways of doing this, either by asking the Lord to drive the spirit away, or to directly address the spirit yourself and tell it to leave. Dire à cet esprit de partir. Started, it really started with a personal encounter with the Lord. I was baptized in the Holy Spirit in January of 1970. Over the years, I began to realize that I wasn't as free as I'd like to be. And, and at that time, uh, people that prayed for deliverance only prayed for people that were severely demonized, that had, had big problems. And so whenever I would ask somebody to pray for me for deliverance, they would say, oh, don't give the devil too much attention. And, and, uh, and they looked at my life and they could see that I prayed every day and I was serving the Lord and, and they didn't, nobody wanted to pray for me. So I had to wait for almost 15 years before somebody said yes. So this one day I was, I was at a conference and the Lord really touched me and he, he renewed me. In, like in worship, I wept for the first time and, and that I could remember just because he loved me. And I saw this man that I knew prayed for deliverance. I, I, says, I went up to him and I said, would you pray for me for deliverance? I th always thought I needed some freedom. And he said, well, what makes you think you need deliverance? And I said, here we go again. <laughs> uh, but this time I said to him, I said, you know, before a spiritual event, oftentimes my back would go out. And before I came to this conference, my back acted up. And I, I spent the first couple days of the conference in the back of the room laying on the, on the ground. And, he said, okay, so I'll pray for you. He prayed, and then he said, do you feel that? And I felt something right here. And I said, yes, I feel that. But in my head, I was thinking, that's not of that, that's me. And, uh, and then he asked, what happened to you? And I didn't really respond from my memory. I responded, just responded to his authority in the question he asked. And I, I said I was humiliated in front of the class in first grade. The next thing I remember is that he said, in the name of Jesus, I command a spirit of rejection to leave. And I felt this thing that, was a, uh, that I thought belonged here just kind of gently lift off my head. And, uh, and so I experienced what it means to be set free, what it means to be delivered. And yet it took... Uh, a number of years before I learned how I could give this away to other people. Neil Lozano of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania is Catholic. He's the founder of the Ministry of the Heart of the Father and author of Unbound, A Practical Guide to Deliverance. He was one of the main speakers at the conference on the issue, attended by 400 people from different churches and led by the Chemin Neuf community in Tigery, near Paris, France. I'm best known for my book, Unbound, A Practical Guide to Deliverance. It's published in numerous countries and languages. In that book, I talk about the five keys. And the five keys are repentance and faith, forgiveness, renunciation, authority, and the Father's blessing. So the image that I use in the book is that if you picture a door with five locks and you have five keys, but you just use two or three of them, 
the door stays locked. But if you use all five, the door opens. So there's a, there's a way in which all these five keys uh, fit together uh, in, a, in a beautiful way as we minister to people. So sometimes when we teach about repentance and faith, people think only about repentance. But it's, uh, Jesus uh, joined when he, when he came in from the desert. He proclaimed the kingdom of God is here. Repent and believe. He connected the two together. So there, 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 there's one action of conversion. It's turning away, renewing your mind, and embracing the truth. So we will lead people, even those that have, have a commitment to Jesus, we will give them an opportunity. We'll say, would you like to pray a prayer of surrender to Jesus today? Or if they've never had that opportunity, we'll say, would, would you like to commit your life to the Lord? And would, would you like to embrace him as your savior? The second key is the most, uh, one of the most significant ones is forgiveness. A lot of people, most people know that they need to forgive. Um, but a lot of people are stuck. They don't quite kind of get freedom, the freedom they need when uh, they should get when they forgive in Jesus' name. And so we, we listen to the story and... Uh, and then we'll help them to pronounce forgiveness. And so we might say, in the name of Jesus, I forgive my dad uh, for choosing alcohol over me. I forgive him for his angry words. And I forgive him for being emotionally absent from me. I forgive him for, for not being the dad I needed him to be. And I forgive him for the way he treated mom, especially when he, he yelled at her and hit her. You know, whatever the story might be, you know, when, when someone is able to tell their story, sometimes that itself opens up and validates their story so that they can forgive. I remember this one man I prayed with not too long ago. And I said, you know, when you're alone in your thoughts, what kind of negative thoughts come to your mind? And he, says, he said, well, I, I think I'm a loser, and I'm never going to amount to anything. And then I said, did anybody ever say that to you? And he said, he thought for a moment, he said, my dad spoke those words. And you know, sometimes words have power. And when, when words are, are spoken, even if they're isolated, they can stick. So recognizing the lies, recognizing the strategies of the enemy and just speaking out loud and saying in the name of Jesus I renounce self-hatred in the name of Jesus I renounce a loneliness an isolation in the name of Jesus I renounce sadness in the name of Jesus I renounce shame in the name of Jesus I renounce the lie that something's wrong with me I, in the name of Jesus I renounce the lie that that everything's my fault in the name of Jesus, I renounce the lie that I have to be perfect to be accepted. You know, so the, there's as many lies as there are people and as many different lies as there is our imagination. Uh, if it doesn't line up with God's word, it doesn't line up with the truth, then we can renounce it. The fourth key is authority. And I find that a lot of Christians don't understand that they have authority. In the scriptures it says uh, that, that we have been given the power. And another translation of that word is authority. We've been given the authority to become the children of God. And we have authority over anything that God has given us responsibility for. And one of the things that we know that he's given us responsibility for is our own souls and our own lives. And uh, we shouldn't be bashful about uh, knowing that uh, we can speak in the name of Jesus to break the power of the lies that we've believed and command any spirit that's attached to them to leave. Mm -hmm. 
And the fifth key is the Father's blessing, which is, uh, which is something that uh, I, I needed to learn over the years. Something from the very beginning of my walk with, with Jesus, uh, Jesus began to show me the face of the Father. So many of us want to be free from things, but we'll never understand the full freedom Jesus won for us until we understand what he's bringing us into, which is uh, the love of the Father, the heart of the Father. To me, deliverance is about freedom. Jesus said to Peter, you are rock, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the nether world will not stand against it. That tells us that Satan is on the retreat. The church is on the offensive, just as Jesus was, against the kingdom of darkness, taking ground from the kingdom of darkness. So no Christian should feel like we are fleeing in terror from the advance of Satan. I can say that in the last few years of my ministry, and also in the writing of this document, I have become increasingly aware of how simple the issue of deliverance is. As I've already said, it's part of everyday life, and it's very simple. I realize that quite easily, even as I'm walking down the street. I may suddenly feel that I am being attacked by a thought. Then after a while, I start to recognize my personal demons. I start to recognize the thoughts that come to mind, and I say, I renounce it. And I keep walking, and everything is fine again. Deliverance ministry has also become a more important part of the prayer ministry that I do when I'm praying over people, I have a deeper consciousness of the fact that evil spirits very often are playing a role when someone is, is in some way oppressed or depressed or feeling uh, that they're in bondage in some way. And I have a greater sense of the authority that all baptized believers have in the name of Jesus to resist the evil one, to cast out demons, to tell them that they have no place in those who have been purchased by his precious blood. And so I'm more confident of his victory and our share in his victory. As the great pastor Thomas Roberts used to say, you have to believe in a very big Jesus and a very little devil. And I would add, you must believe in a big Jesus, and then you must know that a very small devil exists, because one doesn't believe in the devil. So the devil and the demons have been defeated. They are small in relation to the saving power of Christ, but they exist. And if we refuse to accept that they exist, then we become vulnerable to superstition, and ultimately, to leaving the back door open to them. The evil one wants to make us think he's more powerful than he is. He's lost. He's a loser. And even the gates, the last stand of an army against an advancing army, even the gates of the netherworld will not stand against the church in the power of the name of Jesus overcoming evil. From the letter to the Colossians. Let us give thanks to the Father for having made you worthy to share the lot of the saints in light. He rescued us from the power of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his beloved Son. Through him we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. Lord Jesus, you who have come to save us and have already won the victory over evil, Open our eyes to all the ties that bind us. Come and deliver us. 
help us to be aware of the authority over evil spirits that you've granted us at our baptism. May the Holy Spirit lead our churches in deliverance ministry, which so many people in the world today urgently need.